and we came from Norwell, Massachusetts. That's where I live yesterday. This is our second day on the tour. You probably saw that big bus. We're going to go all the way around the country. And I travel with my husband, and it's kind of fun because I, he's a musician, and I go with him on his tour. So I don't know how many of you play a musical instrument or sing, but you know in the symphony orchestra, there's the different families of instruments. So you have the brass, the percussion, the woodwinds, and then the string section. So the smallest of the strings is the violin. So put it under your chin. It often has a melody in the symphony orchestra. A little bit larger is the viola. It has a little bit of a deeper voice and supports the, the violin, but sometimes has its own part in the orchestra. Next comes the cello. So it sits on the floor. It's made out of wood, and you play it with a bow, and it is said to have the closest of all the instruments to the human voice, the range. But then if the orchestra is going to play a symphony that needs grandeur and majesty, they choose the double bass to play that part. It's over six feet tall, and it's like the cello, but much bigger. And that's what my husband, Joe, has played in the Boston Symphony for 63 years. So he started when he was 19 in Julia. So Joe's going to say hi. <laughs> bass player. I don't know. I there was a bass player this morning, so I'm hoping you can be more bass players. And if you, I'd love to hear if you play a musical instrument, because I'm not a musician, but I'd love to listen. Well, when um, this is my new book, and today I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got an idea for this book, because I know a lot of you are either thinking up stories to make your own book, or you already have made um, your own book, and you're going for your second one or third one. And this Alice is really a story that was written in 1864 by Lewis Carroll, but I'm doing a retelling of it. Like Walt Disney did that before me. <laughs> so I'm not the first one, but I'll tell you about my take on it, because I put the setting in a different place. And then um, I'll draw you a picture. I brought all my art supplies because I know a lot of you are artists and I like to talk about, you know, drawing, coloring, and imagining because it's been so much fun for me to do that. I hope that you have a chance to do it too. And then at the end, I'll send you a book. I can't wait to meet all of you. And if you bring any of your artwork, I'd love to admire that. This book is about a little girl who follows a rabbit down a rabbit hole. It said in England, that's where Lewis Carroll was a professor at Oxford University. He was a math professor. So I was remembering that when I did my story. But I wanted to make mine a little bit different, and I wanted to not change a few things, but make them my own. And so I set my book in Alaska, and this is why. I went to Juneau, that's the capital of Alaska. And when um, we were going to, when we were in Juneau, you, if you depict of this town, it's like right on the ocean, and it's, it's very beautiful, but you can't get there by road, or you have to go by airplane or ocean. And then above the town is this giant glacier. It's called the Mendenhall Glacier, and it has, um, it's like four miles thick in some places. So when it comes down to the sea, then the pieces of gla glacier break off and go into this lake, and then the lake water of the lake goes into the ocean. So we were up on the glacier. We had to take a helicopter up there. And it was um, in the summertime, but of course it's a glacier, so it's all ice. And I don't know if you're skiers, but like the top of it is like corn snow. It's like ice that has been frozen and then melted and frozen and melted. But then we spotted like a little river-like place, and I found out there's all kinds of terms about glaciers. So I. I kept thinking, boy, I would really love to start life over again and be a glacier explorer and scientist because they're so intriguing because it actually moves like a giant river of ice. And some of that water it fell as snow to the earth like thousands of years ago. So scientists drill it and try to find out what they can about climate change. So that's kind of interesting too. But so when I was walking along and there was this hole. It was like about the size of like um, a, a huge rabbit hole. I mean, a person could not fall down on it. And then you look uh, over the edge and it's like all colors are blue and green. Like, you know, sometimes you see on the side of the highway, the ice that comes down and it's like really pretty colors. That's what color it was. And you look down there and you could not see the bottom. And so the guide, because glaciers can be dangerous because of the, um, 
what are those called? Uh, they're like really huge rifts in the glacier, crevasses, that's what they're called. And um, you have to be very careful, so we had a guide, and you could look down, and it probably went down to the bottom of the glacier, so miles and miles. It's like a drain hall called a moulin, M-O-U-L-I-N, means drain in French. And then also they had uh, huskies, uh, Alaskan huskies, like pulling sleds up there for practice in the summer. It was, real, it was really a fun trip, so I would recommend it. So I thought, oh, I could have Alice be an Alaskan girl, and she would fall, look at the rabbit going down the glacier, because there's, sometimes you do see animals up there. They were telling us there was a huge grizzly bear up on the glacier one time, and so, of course, a rabbit could be up there, too, and um, it could go down the hole, and she could follow. So this is the page. It's probably my favorite page in the book because it starts out like this. She and her sister, it's kind of from the olden days, like the days of the gold rush. <coughs> you probably <coughs> know that um, Alaska had a gold rush. And lots of prospectors went up there to look for a gold. They had um, <coughs> a little mine. So I turned that book upside down so you could see her falling down the hole. And then she lands on a bed of moss. And because, <coughs> excuse me, um, and you can see all the things frozen in the ice, like there's a, um, a tusk from a woolly mammoth, because where she lands is like a lost world. So when I was going around with my art portfolio, part portfolio as an artist, I um, went to my one of the publishing companies, and they said, well, we like your artwork, but it would be better if you told the story yourself. And I said, well, I'm not really a writer. I'm more of an illustrator, because I love to draw ever since I was in kindergarten. If you went into my kindergarten class and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said, children's book illustrator. So now when some a child or a young person tells me they want to be something, I believe them because that's what happened to me. And he said, well, Jen, you know, there's only like 10 stories. It's just the way you tell it that makes it special. So there's like the story of you can't go back home again, everything changes, or there's a story of you have something that bothers you about yourself, but it, but it turns out to be a superpower in the end, or in this case, she goes to a hidden world. So like that would be like Jurassic Park is a hidden world, or Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I love that book where you went in back of the wardrobe, which is like a big drawer, chest of drawers, and they went into a hidden world. And so she goes into the Pleistocene, my favorite era. It had woolly man, I mean, humans lived there. It was like 12,000 to 10,000 years ago. And North America was glaciated four different times as the glacier would come down and then go back and then come down and go back. And there were like rifts in the glacier, so quarters. And I think that that's how people went from the land bridge um, in the Bering Sea down through some of those rifts and then came down to the United States. As a matter of fact, there are, tr there are tribes in Alaska that can understand Apache in the in Native Americans in the Southwest. They have the same roots in their language and they think that is because they came down thousands and thousands of years ago and they still kept some of their language. I thought that was a really interesting tidbit. So she's coming down the rabbit hole and then if you can see there's car playing cards well, Lewis Carroll, because he was a math professor, he also loved puzzles and things to do with numbers. And so the cards spell out pi. So if any of you like math, you'll know about pi. It's this one number that can't be divided. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. So it starts four, no, three point one, and then it goes all the way through the book because it goes on to infinity. That's why I have it so far. So you can. Nobody knows that. I didn't say that in the flap, the flap copy because I wanted somebody to recognize it and feel like they were special because they are good observers. So I took some of my characters from Lewis Carroll's story. Like, for example, he has a dodo. So a dodo is a large extinct bird with a great big bill. So now this book is set in Alaska, but dodos lived in Mauritius as an island off Africa. So the, we had a bird that was more on up by Newfoundland called the Great Auk. And it went extinct like in the 1800s, not that long ago. And it was like three feet tall and it had a great big thick beak just like the dodo. And it was flightless like the dodo. So I put the Great Auk in. And then the best part was Lewis Carroll had the, his very famous um, Cheshire cat. So apparently his little friend that he wrote the, his book for, Alice, 
Liddell, that was her name. She looks a little bit like this because I saw a picture of her, a photograph of her. And this, um, th th they used to have this cheese there in Cheshire that had a ca grinning cat on it. And so he made that the Cheshire cat. So I made it a Smilodon because this was a saber tooth cat that lived in North America, the same time people lived here. So that was my idea of the Cheshire cat would have a Smilodon because it was a smile in Smilodon and it's a grinning cat. So I thought that was very clever of me. And <laughs> <laughs> there were also like woolly mammoths, like they're still digging up woolly mammoths. They just they just found frozen in the ice a baby one. It still had the fur on it and everything and the giant tusks. So I thought that was really cool. And then if you go, if you ever go to um, Alaska, there's this museum in Fairbanks, which is pretty far up north. It's called Museum of the North. And they have this um, step ox. And it was like its horns were huge, bigger than like Highland cattle, if you know what those are. It's like twice as big. And it's blue. It's called Babe the Blue Ox. And it's like intact. It's in a big black case, um, glass case. And it looks just like this giant blue ox. And that came from 37,000 years ago. So, so I thought the perfect place for her to land when she goes down the rabbit hole is into the Pleistocene. So I had a lot of fun with that. But I think I'll go on to the drawing now. I'm trying to think of something else. Oh, yeah. I, one thing is that. Lewis Carroll's book was like a novella. It was like a small novel. It was really, um, really long. And I wanted to do a picture book because I'm an illustrator and I like to draw pictures. But he had these wonderful poems in it. Like Beautiful Soup is one of the best poems. But then my favorite is, it's like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So you go, um, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat, how I wonder where you're at. Um, up in the sky so blue, like a tea tray in the sky. No, wait a minute. I forget about the, it twinkles like in the sky, like a tea tray in the sky. No, that's not either. either. Well, it's a whimsical, nonsense poem. <laughs> I'm making it even more nonsensical. But I have a bat in the book, so any of you bat lovers. There's also a griffin, so I know a lot of you like mythical animals. So it's, the griffin is eagle, eagle head, lion body, has wings and like big eagle feet. So those were all things, fun things to draw. And then also the king and queen. In Lewis Carroll's story, the queen is a real lady, but she's really, um, she's always telling, off with your head, off with your head. And then the, in my book, it's a snowy owl. Because in the Arctic, they're the apex avian predator because they um, you know, are so huge. It's the biggest owl in North America. You probably know it from Harry Potter. It, that's the snowy owl. So I got to put that in my book. and. Puffins, I got, you have in Maine, off the coast of Maine, you have um, Atlantic puffins. In Alaska, they have corn puffins. So all the creatures are in Alaska except for the mythological ones. Those are just exotic ones that, we, that I made up or took from Lewis Carroll's story. So I'm going to show you um, how to draw a, thank you, Jill, a, a the white rabbit. So we have a white rabbit named Little Snow. He's been in a lot of books. And I, I bet I'll have some um, people in my line that have a rabbit. You have to tell me all about yours. Well, ours is in Joe's office, and he's, he's really a nice rabbit. And he's been in so many books. But the reason that we picked him out as a little baby bunny was because he looked like the kind of rabbits you see in the wild that are white, and then they have um, little black tips on their ears. And in Alaska, they have a varying hair. It's a kind of snowshoe rabbit. And in the summer, well, starting in spring, it starts to get brown spots on it. It's pure white, right? Gets a little, and in the wintertime, it's all snow. Then the, br the little brown spots appear, and then it turns pure brown in the summer when it blends in with all the tundra. So that's how it protects itself by hiding from, well, what would be up there? Probably wolves and foxes. Arctic fox might make a meal out of a little rabbit. So there, here is these long ears, and then his little, if you took like a half an orange, that's kind of the shape of its head, and the, bat, the back of the head kind of goes down straight. So that is, a, a rabbit is a little bit hard to draw, and I've had them in a lot of books, and I've been kind of discouraged about how to make them smile, because, <laughs> because the, the mouth is underneath the, 
like nose area, so it's really hard to make them smile, but I'm gonna try to do it with the eye. So I'm gonna put a little dot where I'm gonna put the eye in, and then I have a demonstration. This is the only demonstration I'm gonna do, don't worry. Well, anyway, it's about um, how important the eyes are, because I know a lot of you love to draw and you want to get better at drawing, and so I'm just gonna tell you a few helpful hints that help, help me, maybe they'll help you too. And the first one is, when you're drawing a character, it could be um, an animal, a person, a robot, anything, but pay the most attention when you're drawing your creature's eyes, because as human beings, that's where we immediately look to try to figure out what that person is thinking. So that when you see your best friend and their eyes are wide open and they're all, you know that they're all excited because they're about to tell you something really interesting, like they might be going on a giant trip or let's say somebody has stubbed their toe and they've got their, eye, their face is kind of crunched up and you know, ooh, something happened that's not good. It might have, you know, she's hurting. So we always look at the eyes and, and it's, or it's very nuanced too. So I have three faces that I'm gonna make. And the first one, I'm gonna just start covering up like all my face except for my eyes, gonna turn around and then when I face you again, I'm gonna be either happy, sad, scared, surprised or something else. And you can, I want you to guess. So this is gonna be the proof of like how important the eyes are. Okay, so you ready? You have, to, you have to say out loud what you think I'm thinking. Okay, so here's number one. Happy, so you didn't even have to, if you were drawing me, the eyes are telling you everything that you needed to know. And I think what happens is underneath my hands, the kind of my cheeks went up, it's like corners of my mouth went up, and then my eyes became more crescent shaped. And maybe because I was a little bit excited, my um, eyebrows went up too. So I was like, like happy and excited. So that's like a little combo. So that was really good that you saw that right away. And think about that when you're drawing. And like what I do sometimes is if I'm drawing my character, I'm gonna make him like a little bit winsome, which means lovable kind of, lovable and maybe a little vulnerable. And um, so I'm gonna try number two. See, see if you can guess this one. So, so this time, <laughs> the corners of my mouth are going down. It probably pulls my whole bottom of my face down a little bit. And then the eyebrows would be the key thing, not just the eyes. So my, they're kind of like tinted like this. And then probably like wrinkles are forming right here. And all those things are kind of a combo to show, you know, that I'm sad. And then the, this is the third one. This is a more complicated. We'll see if you can get this one. Surprise! Well, I'm looking surprised, but also like amazed. So I was pretending there was a spaceship with a little alien coming down the ladder there, and a little baby dino d over here, dino, like dinosaur, baby dino, over here. So when you're, and I used a little body language. So when you're um, surprised or you're curious or you're looking at something and you're amazed, your eyes will widen because you have a bigger field of vision. And you might've noticed I was blinking and that kind of clears your eyes when you're blinking. You know how when you first wake up, you kind of open and close your eyes? So I was doing that. And you can't have motion in a book, but you can have that look of like the wide open eyes. And then I used a little body language. That means as I use my body, I know that some of you are probably going love theater and acting. So I might be stepping forward a little bit and putting the weight on this foot as if I'm ready to move. Because if I saw an alien, I would either be thinking, should I go a little closer and and find out what's going on, or should I be ready to turn tail and run? And then you can use that again and again in your pictures so that your characters, you know, have a real personality and you, they help tell the story. So like if you're mad, you might have your, uh, your shoulders up a little bit and your fists clenched and you might have more of a stiff aspect to the top of your body. Or if you're like sleepy, you might have as if your legs bending a little bit, maybe your head's a little bit to the side because you're just so sleepy, you can't hold your head up. That's an old expression. And all those things will make your character just be believable and that person will be all interested in it and they'll follow along with your story. So that's what I try to do too. And so I'm making him, he's gonna be looking up at, the, I'm paying mo the most attention to his eyes more than any other part of the rabbit. And their eyes are kind of on the, they're not kind of, they're on, the top half of their head. And I'm gonna make his pupil looking up at the sky and I'm leaving a little white dot. So if the lights were up, up, 
you would, and you looked at your next door neighbor, you would find that there's a little white uh, sparkle in their eye. So it makes, because our eyes are so reflective, so you could also use that when you're drawing your character is like that little sparkle in their eye. And then rabbits don't have eyebrows, but I want to make him look like he's a little bit, well, winsome was the word I used. So I'm using a tuft of fur to make it look like an eyebrow. And that's called anthropomorphism. It just means making your creature look like a hu having human expressions. So <laughs> I always have trouble with that word, anthropomorphism. I was practicing. It didn't help. <laughs> okay. So here's here's like the, his fluffy fur, and then he's Lewis Carroll had his dressed up, and he was like running down, leaping down the rabbit hole, going, "It's late! It's late!" And he's got a pocket watch, looking at his pocket watch, and that's when she first falls asleep, and then she has starts her adventure. So you'll see that a lot of times there's like. In the beginning of a story, there'll be some moment where the adventure starts. And in this book, it's when the rabbit goes down the rabbit hole and she follows him. That's the moment the adventure begins. So that it's even, it was such a, um, oh, how would you describe it? It's such a potent expression that now we even say, oh, it's, I just went down the rabbit hole, meaning that you followed your, um, you followed a, an idea and it kept taking you places. Happens on the internet all the time. Okay, so here's the bottom part of the rabbit. So I had a lot of time practicing on um, Little Snow, our rabbit. He's going to be running. But rabbits are not the easiest thing to draw. When I was little, I only drew horses. So I got very good at drawing horses with my best friend Marla. We would draw horses. We didn't have a horse, so and the next best thing was to make them up ourselves. So we had imaginary horses. My horse's name was Yankee. He was chestnut with a white blaze and four white socks. And my friend Marla's horse was named Rebel, and he was a dapple gray with uh, black socks. So when you're um, thinking about what you, you're doing these days, you can remember that many years later, you'll probably remember some of those same things because you don't forget those indelible childhood experiences. Well, some you do, some you don't, but it's kind of fun to remember them. Okay, so there is the rabbit. I'm gonna color him in because I wanna make it like an art lesson. Now, I've never taught art. As a matter of fact, my mother, she was a very wise woman and she was a teacher and she gave us lots of art materials. She limited TV. And she just gave us lots of time to do our coloring or building castles with blocks and things like that. And um, she said no art lessons because she wanted us to develop our own style. So maybe that's why I'm an illustrator. Oh, also we love books. And my fa one of my favorites was Alice in Wonderland because I love the whimsy of it, which means you never know what's going to come next. And sometimes it doesn't make all that much, much sense. And when you're a kid, there's a lot of things about the world that doesn't, that don't make that much sense. You have to kind of figure things out. So there's his yellow coat. What comes next? I think I'm going to do his red vest underneath. And then I'm gonna show shading. <laughs> and the plaid jacket. So when I am at my art studio, it takes an hour to do an itch. So this is going to be very sketchy. And I don't have a cookie timer or anything that says an hour is up, I've done an itch. Because like sky might not take as long as something else. But faces definitely take the longest. So there's his, his part of his jacket. And I wanted to put lots of bright colors in it because I have an art director and an editor. So the editor at my publishing house, he, she helps me with words. So I will do the um, first draft of the story, and there's lots of drafts, so when your teacher says, well, that's a great first draft, don't worry about it, because a lot of times good ideas come in the second draft or the third draft. And she's thinking, well, maybe, or he, maybe thinking, oh, I'm going to give her a chance to get some more ideas and make it even a better story. So that's the good thing about doing a book, is you get a lot of chances to improve it. And then I got this great purple color, so people have asked about these markers. They're Prismacolor, 
And some, it used to be that all the really good art stores would have this brand, but they're a little bit more expensive. And sometimes so you get the less expensive ones. But these ones are good because like they're translucent, so you can layer one color on another. So that's my second helpful hint, which is <coughs> to um, layer your, sometimes you can layer your colors if you like that effect. Because I like to think of like on a molecular level, all these little colors are, you know, bouncing around together if you had a microscope. And it kind of makes it look alive. So I'm going to take this pink color. Now rabbits don't usually have pink cheeks, but I'm trying to make them look really lovable. It's like a fiction, a nonfiction character. Whoops, that's more brownish. Here we have more pinkish. Yes, and I'm just going to put a little bit of that on the jacket so it has a little bit more life to it. So you can try that technique if you think it's interesting. Just putting, you know, a, co a couple of colors on, layering it, and the markers are great for that because they're see-through. So that one, some, there's some things that are like um, opaque, which means you can't put more than one color on. And that would be a different technique. Now the most fun thing, well, a after the gold. The gold is the most fun thing, but this is going to be shading. So let's see how this marker is doing. Well, it's really not showing up enough. I've got a couple shades of gray. I'm going to show um, shading because you'll see how he's, right now he's starting out sort of flat-ish. And then I'm just going around the edges of the outline that I made with a gray. And I'm using little brush strokes that are short so that it looks like fur. And then his muzzle is rounded. And you can see how he looks a little bit more realistic. And I would take a long time to do this with my watercolors, which is what I usually use. So now he's starting to look a little bit more lively and like he could pop off the page, if that's my idea. And the face of the watch because he's saying I'm late I'm late and I have two sisters and they've mentioned the fact that he's always late and that I chose this book to do because they still think that there's some reason <laughs> that maybe that would be a book that I would do because I'm always late okay so now I don't know how many of you want to be biologists but here's a little tidbit if you're a biologist you could say, if you want to be a biologist, you know, birds have plumage, which is their feathers. Well, mammals have pelage. So remember that, because you could say, oh, that squirrel has interesting pelage. And everyone will say, what? You say, oh, that just means fur, if you're a biologist. And they would be very impressed by that. <laughs> pelage. And then here's my gold, my favorite. So he's got gold buttons. I've got little shine marks on the gold buttons and on the pocket watch, which is keeps coming up in this story. And then the chain. And then an artist always needs to, oh, he needs one more thing, whiskers. Whiskers, whiskers. And then an artist always signs their work. So my challenge to you is in the next couple of days, when you're saying to somebody else, I'm bored, there's nothing to do. What you can do is get your paper and pencil out and put the kitchen timer on an hour. Cause you, it takes a little while for the magic to start when you're drawing. So you might have an idea, you might not. You start on your page, you could start in the corner, you could start in the middle. And it's just a sketching around and then I'll keep going and keep going with it. And then all of a sudden you get a picture and sometimes you don't even know where that idea came from. It's just a sort of, sort of a magical thing that happens when you draw. So. Um, drawing is so interesting because you don't really need a teacher or you don't need um, a lessons. I mean, I, lo I look at animals and observe things, but I, I never really had a teacher of art until I went to museum school, and, and that helped. But it's like um, if, you teach, if you did the drawing at some time, like Thanksgiving time about, and then put it in a drawer, and then you just keep drawing all winter and the early spring, and then by Easter time, you did another drawing, and you put them side by side, you'd say, oh my gosh, I've really improved. Do I have a unique style that's just me, that I have that nobody else has? Which is really a, really a cool thing to have. So I want to encourage you. And there's something about drawing with your hand, I think that encourages that true style to come out. Because like if you're doing it on the computer, you're selecting things that other people have thought up. But if you're just drawing, it's like 
truly your own. So I would encourage you to do both, not just the computer stuff. So I love to draw and illustrate, but my favorite thing is like I'll be working late at night and I'll be drawing and drawing and drawing and you kind of go into a zone, they call it, where you're just, the world around you kind of disappears and you get very intent on your drawing. And sometimes that happens to me and then I'm like, I'm so tired, I just go to bed. Then the, in the morning I go downstairs and I go like, oh my gosh, it looks like, looks like elves were here because there'll be all these additions to my drawing that I don't really, wasn't really conscious of doing, but it just happens. And so I hope that you will give yourself a chance to have that magic happen because it comes from like someplace inside you didn't know you had, like maybe your soul or your muse or whatever. And when that happens, you have like a sense of discovery and accomplishment and just just the kind of like wow kind of thing that happens like I did this. So um, happy drawing and happy reading. Thank you. I'm looking forward to meeting you.